as stated, my name is Robin Stevens, and I work for the uh, Washington County Public Defender's Office. I take my badge off. I came from the office. But um, in addition to that, I also am the chair of the Washington County Democratic Party Black Caucus. And when I became the chair of the Black Caucus, I decided that one of the things that I believe is really missing in our wonderful, um, progressive, diverse county is conversations about that, the lack thereof. But the perception that we put out that it is this really diverse, you know, utopia that we all live in. But if you live in it from my vantage point, it's not what they told me when I came here. So um, I have been doing this for, like uh, Sally said, since September, and we do them once a month here at the LRC, and we get you know a really good crowd of people with very diverse backgrounds. And the challenge to it is that you have to be open to be to look within yourself because this isn't about me telling you you're racist. It's about you finding out that you're racist and you didn't know that because you know people put labels on us and they tell us that we are things and then we accept it. But when we really look inside ourselves, we may not be what that label says that we are. So that's why it's always important for me, and I'll set those ground rules here today, is that nobody's right, nobody's wrong, and the main thing is nobody's trying to change your, your 60 or however many years of living and what you believe. But we are asking you to challenge yourself to look within yourself, because that's really where the change comes from. I can't change you. And you know, I found that out when I had kids. Why isn't this kid doing what I told him to do? <laughs> and you figure out, you know, kids have their own personalities and they do their own thing. And you have to learn how to guide them without them knowing that's what you're doing. And that, that was really difficult. And um, I learned so much from that experience. I don't ever want to do it again. I only have two. But I learned <laughs> so much from that whole, you know, raising kid experiences and particularly raising two African American kids in Ann Arbor, which is supposed to be the utopia for African American kids in terms of education and all these opportunities. Yeah, okay. <laughs> of course, I'm still waiting on them to, to wake up and realize that that's what, what this is. But part of their resistance, if I want to call it that, and my daughter and I have talked about it. She's 32 and she went to Pioneer. My son went to community because he's much more um, um, creative than she is. And uh, so, so we've talked about you know, their experiences in Ann Arbor Public Schools and particularly at a school like Pioneer where it's so big and you can easily get lost. And as a child of color, how there's a, such a low expectation from you anyway. Um, from the school, but not from your mom. So you're hearing one thing at the school and you're hearing something else from your parent. And how do you uh, get both of those things? Hello, come on in, get something to eat, and join the, the discussion. <laughs> um, so again, I, I, I thank my kids for that, and um, I thank Ann Arbor for that because it really opened up my eyes to a lot. It inspired me to want to run for judge because many of you who may not work in the system, I am assigned right now to uh, judge. Brown's courtroom, which is a felony courtroom. So I've been in every court in Washtenaw County. I've worked for the Public Defender's Office since 99, and I've been assigned to every court in the county. So to be in that criminal justice system where you see the inequity from the inside has really done a lot to teach me and to help me feel like I need to share that with other people. And I do have a series on the whole justice system that we put together, and we're going to start um, like sharing with people because we have a really, really important election. I'll put this plug in real quick. Coming up in um, 2018, Judge Simpson, who is the only minority judge, and when I say minority, I'm not including, you know, I, I understand that uh, Judge Kunky is in a same sex relationship, and I appreciate that and I respect that. But that is not diversity. When you walk into her courtroom, you see a white woman, period. You don't know who she's sleeping with. You don't know what her preferences are. But if you walk into the courtroom and you see a person that looks like me, then you know that that is a person of color and may have had some connection with you and your experiences and so forth. So unfortunately, a lot of the people that go through our criminal justice system don't get that. They don't have a lot of uh, black probation officers. and, and, and I. I say black because 
60 years of being black, of course, this is an important issue for me because I also have grandchildren coming up and other people that I feel a, a need and a responsibility to make sure that their opportunities are open as much as possible and that these things are talked about. But I don't just mean black and white. Diversity is across the board, like I said, same sex, transgender, whatever, that is all diversity. And we need all of those voices at the table, but there is something about the physical, like actually seeing it, that makes that whole difference when you walk into a room or you walk into a courtroom or you, you know, walk into a boardroom where you have to do a presentation like this. Um, but it's important, like I said, that you all understand that this is not about someone lecturing at you and telling you what you should be thinking because I have not had your life experience, but I do know that at some point, you're going to be responsible for what you think and why you think it. So this series is designed really to just kind of make you stop and think about, you know, I hear people say, oh, I'm not racist. Well, who gets to decide if you're racist or not? Or who gets to decide, you know, if you're fat or not? Who, who, who gets to make those decisions? Right, who knows, <laughs> right? Someone came up with the word racism and applied it, and so now, you know, it's just kind of a thing. When you say racism, people think of certain things. When you say, you know, white or black, people think certain things. Or when you say a fat person versus a skinny, well, she was a, you know, a black fat woman, then, you know, there's a certain image that comes up in their mind. And so those are the things that we need for each and every one of us to be um, cognizant of and aware of within ourselves, because again, that's the only way the change is going to come about is when you look within yourself and really identify what you believe, why you believe it, and when you say, I am not racist, is that you saying you're not racist based on your standards? But if I heard the same stuff from you, would I as a person of color, with my experience and my beliefs and my background, believe that you're not racist? Which one is right, we don't know, but again, within yourself. So I have a really short clip that talks about your biases because again, racism, and I, I, I hate when people say, well, it's the Webster's Dictionary, whatever, <laughs> who wrote that, some white men. <laughs> and I have nothing against white men, right on, y'all got the power, right on, my brothers. But I think that you have to listen to the voice of others in order to be really open and being able to grow, because this is really about growth. So I don't take the Webster's Dictionary um, definition of too much. You know, of course, the, a dog is a dog, because that's what we call them, but what if we had called it a fish? You know what I mean? So let's just go with the fact that this is what the label that has been put on, but do those labels from the time that you are, you know, two or three, that you hear, how do they affect you once you get to be an, a grown adult and you're impacting the world around you and specifically impacting this community that we call open and progressive and diverse and inclusive and we don't have but one judge of color in the most, one of the most important systems. We don't have people of color on city council in the big city that kind of runs this county. We don't have people of color in all of these really kind of key decision-making um, places. And what does that do to us as a community? How are your personal biases that you, we all try to put aside and act like they're not there when in the back of your mind you see someone or you see a picture and there are automatically um, things that you attach to that just because that's what you've been taught as a child. So really trying to, like I said, to make us all kind of be more aware of our kind of unconscious and internal biases, which do lead to racism and other kind of isms. And then, like I said, being more responsible to each other. Uh, Sally told me that people have to leave because they have to go to some civil mediation. I won't take it personal. I don't take too much personal. Um, thank you very much, and I have food, so now I'm really good. Um, so if you have to leave for whatever reason, or go to the bathroom, or you want something to eat, or whatever, um, this is a discussion that we're going to have with you or without you. It's always better when you're with us, but if you have to leave, we get 
and we will continue the discussion and hopefully this won't be the only discussion because you like me are serving the public um, before I worked for the public defender's office I was a single mom of just my daughter at that time living out in Sycamore Meadows woke up one morning and they had a uh, roped off the side of my building because somebody had got killed and I had slept through all of that because I don't engage in that kind of, you know, activity. <laughs> do what I got to do, go home, shut the door. Um, but it was an interesting dynamic going from that, living in Sycamore Meadows where there was all this stuff going on, to moving over to the University of Michigan when I got accepted there and living in family housing where everything was all rosy and peachy. And I'm not from Washtenaw County. I moved here to, to, to come to school. And so it was like, wow, there's two cities this close, and they really have these kind of, you know, different and strange experiences. <laughs> it's like, wow, what do I do with this? So I found for myself that I did have some biases, and I was a little careful about, you know, who I let my daughter be exposed to and who I let her play with and stuff like that, because I didn't know how these people, you know, were going to accept her. Where when I was in Sycamore Meadows, it's like, yeah, we all on welfare, it's all good, you know, we all out here in the struggle. So it's just that, that whole difference in having those experiences that have helped me get to this point where I see <coughs> that all of us believe that we have come so far and we've progressed so much, but it's the little things and the conversations that we have that really show we have a lot more to do and a, and a lot more to um, accomplish. And I believe that Washtenaw County is a great county and it should be a, a very inclusive county, but unfortunately um, we have this kind of divide at uh, 23 that kind of makes a difference between living on this side of 23 versus living on that side of 23 and the experiences that you have. And I would hope that we as a county of this magnitude with this much education and money and what have you could come together all the way across the board from one end of the county to the other so that we can make sure that all of the Washtenaw County residents are, are doing well and, you know, engaged in the process that, of making this a great community to live in. So again, I have this little uh, clip that we're going to watch and then we're going to kind of talk about this and how this you all um, react to it and what it makes you think about yourself and like I said what your um, biases or not biases as you would think are and of course it's a TED talk <laughs> I love TED talks I watch all the time I don't have a life let me just get this out there I have a bias against women leaders. Is everybody here? No one could be more surprised about this than me. I'm a woman leader. And on top, I even work in human resources, which means it's kind of my job to be unbiased. In fact, I passionately encourage women to step into leadership. My poor kids would definitely tell you why. I never stop talking about it. But in spite of my strong belief that women make great leaders, I've realized I don't always act like Not long ago, within the same week, two members of my team asked me to take a look at their conversation. My first reaction to the man's request was something like, yeah, I'll let you do it. My first reaction to the woman's request was something like, I'm pretty sure you're good. A day or so later, I'm sitting at my desk, hard at work, and I somehow connected what, up until then, I'd seen as two separate events. I had two very different reactions to basically the same request, and I thought, huh, what's up with that? Might I be biased and not even know it? But I know what you're thinking. This is 2016. It's not a topic. Women leaders are everywhere. Maybe you, like me, have personally hired or promoted lots of women leaders. But then I thought, with all this talk of unconscious bias, might something be going on that I'm not even aware of, you know, if it's unconscious and all. For those of you who might not already have been inundated with this in the corporate world, it's a simple concept, and it's backed up by neuroscience. Our brain has to handle way too much information. So when we manage it all, our brain takes the liberty of looking for patterns and filtering for us what it sees as the most important bits, like autopilot our brains to take shortcuts. Without 
these shortcuts, we'd have to sit and really think through way too much information. Imagine if every single time you had to think through everything from how to open doors to how to shake hands to how to sing happy birthday. But brain shortcuts do have a downside because they see patterns that are based on the cumulative effect of everything you've been exposed to throughout your life. Which means the whole thing is happening also in the back of our minds, which means we're not even aware that it's happening. This can cause us to behave in ways that are not true to who we want to be or how we feel we are, and we might not even know it. Unconscious bias sounds kind of clinical, but I looked it up. And other words for unconscious are <coughs> comatose, paralyzed, or senseless. <coughs> and other words for bias are bigotry, intolerance, and unfairness. Okay, so that would mean we're not just unconsciously biased, we're actually senseless, intolerant bigots. So that's not something I want to be, consciously or unconsciously. And here's the scary part. Most of us think we can outsmart it. We believe it when we say things like, I don't see race, or I just hired the best person. It just so happened that at the time of the two pay requests, I was doing research on unconscious bias. And the research said, these are our expectations of men. We expect them to be assertive and strong and driven. And these are our expectations of women. We expect women to be helpful and sensitive and supportive. If we were to make it a little bit tighter, we see men as taking charge and women as taking care. No, it's not because every single one of us is a misogynist. It's simply because men taking charge and women taking care is what we've mostly been exposed to throughout our lives. And our brains will do the rest, unconsciously redirecting us into those patterns that it recognizes. Still feeling like this bias couldn't possibly belong to me, one of the words jumped out at me. Wait a minute. Do I see a man as a provider, and so I looked at his pay request more seriously? And do I not see the woman as a provider, and so I've somehow dismissed her request? In that moment, I had to realize I do. I see men as providers, but not women. Which is really interesting because I'm the sole financial provider for my family of six. My husband is a stay-at-home father for our four children. I take charge, and he takes care. I'm the last person I could imagine who could ever have a bias against women leaders, and yet I had to realize I have a bias against women leaders. I have a bias against myself. And if you're thinking, wow, bad on her, <clears throat> Unfortunately, I'm not the only one with this bias. The research shows that we all have a bias against women leaders. We just don't know it. I had both a man and a woman ask me for a raise at the same time, so I was confronted with my different reactions real time. And I could notice it when I was accidentally treating people differently. Luckily, that happened, and I realized in time, but how many times have I not caught myself? How many times have you not caught yourself? So what's the antidote to being a senseless, intolerant bigot toward women leaders or anyone else? It's a big stretch to imagine that we'll always have the opportunity to cross-check our reactions with two different people in real life. But I realized we don't need to. We can do this comparison mentally, and it's just as eye-opening. Just mentally flip whoever you're dealing with for someone else to test yourself. Like here. I made a slight change to this slide. I flipped the photos. Does anything on this slide feel weird? Flip it to test it. If it feels weird, you might want to check yourself. 
the more I tried it, the more I saw the value. In fact, there's this Twitter account that just flips the gender of things we commonly say, and suddenly, they become funny. Being called a policewoman doesn't bother me at all, because I know it covers both women and men. Andrew, policewoman, age 40. Or, let's take my hometown baseball team with the Cleveland Indians. Flip it to test it. How would you feel to be up in the stands cheering for the Cleveland Caucasians? <laughs> now, maybe you're thinking, this doesn't happen to me. And maybe you're right. Maybe you are a superhuman person who manages to intercept those brain shortcuts at exactly the right moment to ensure you're behaving bias-free and consistently with your values and beliefs in all of your actions. It could very well be. But what have you got to lose to double check yourself? If we all started to flip it to test it, we might just be surprised at how often we would choose to behave differently. Because what if you're missing an opportunity to see the world differently? Of course, it would end when I had something in my mouth. <laughs> Sorry about that. How thoughtful. Um, can we get some initial reactions to that? Do you feel it's true, not true? Anybody in here feel like they don't have any biases? You can leave now. <laughs> I mean, you're perfect. We don't need to talk to you. Well, it's true. And uh, I, I thought that was a really good idea. She had to test it. Mm -hmm. okay. Think about it. I don't know. Sometimes you can't always think of how. When she said Cleveland Indians, I wasn't sure how to flip it, but then. Absolutely. Anyone else? I found I was biased against your six-inch heels. <laughs> I am absolutely biased against that. I hate women that can wear heels like that. Or do. Did you notice that she didn't move around much? <laughs> Oh. Yeah, she was just standing there. Uh -huh. I stand in play shoes. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but I think Sally has a good point there. There's a difference in the way that we look at a woman in six inch heels than a woman who's wearing flats or, you know, wearing more what my daughter calls granny shoes. She says, Mom, all your shoes are granny shoes. That's because I'm not trying to die. Oh, <laughs> just to walk. I'm just trying to walk. I'm just trying to get somewhere. But hers, of course, she's 30, so her heels are like that. But there's just a certain kind of, you know, presentation that you pick up on a woman like that. She's confident, mm -hmm. she can walk in those six inch heels, mm -hmm. she can handle anything. Yeah. And this woman's probably going, oh my God, get the camera off me. <laughs> I want to be done. Yes. So, uh, I know, I, this isn't off topic, but just, I, last night I heard on the radio there was a story about um, people who are uh, transvestite, tra uh, tra transgender, I don't remember which. But I remember the person made the comment how he felt when he first went out. Was well, he was a woman, was a man, and it was becoming a woman. And it was first when he went out with heels and makeup. And I thought, I don't wear heels and makeup. Does that mean I'm not a woman? <laughs> but that was what the story was about, and that sort of offended me because <laughs> I wasn't a woman in the sense that the story was saying they were supposed to be. Right. So, but because I didn't fit that stereotype. But if you, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I will be honest about my biases. If someone says the word transvestite, I think of, you know, some person with a big Adam's apple dressed as a woman who I know as a man. And that's just the image that's in my head, whether I like it or not. And, you know, it but could that be. that includes makeup and high heels. Yeah. And, and that's not necessarily the definition of a woman. Right. But I, I, I promise you, I always look for the big Adam's apple. Like, you know, I know it's a man in there. It's got to be an Adam's apple because all men have big Adam's apples, right? Uh, isn't, it, but, uh, you know, you're, isn't it the stigma of bias against women? I don't wear high heels or makeup, but... Girl, you are not working with society. I don't have a problem with women wearing high heels or makeup. I really don't. I mean, it's their choice. And it sounds like you don't like. No, they were defining our, his womanhood as being wearing makeup and high heels. That, yeah. Therefore, he became a woman. Like he made him a woman. A man wearing makeup and high heels. Why right. does it have to be the definition of being a woman? That was my issue. Right. Yes. It, she didn't go into it, but she made reference to what 
might we be losing out on if we don't pay attention to where that bias, what the bias is? That right. We right. Mm -hmm. and, and and I think that that is very true. That sometimes you make a judgment about someone, and you're like, yeah, I'm going to keep them at length. And actually, that could be the person who ends up helping you the most on whatever you know your project is or or whatever, but we've made this kind of snap judgment about them. And so, yes? Um, I thought the, the point that she was also trying to make was, yes, recognize the bias mm -hmm. that it's, you may or may not be aware, um, but I don't think she was really advocating just get rid of all the biases, but when you recognize it, you adjust your outcome or your attitude. Yeah. Or, and uh, really think about it. Because I don't, I do have lots of biases. I do make a lot of judgment. Mm -hmm. But I don't, if we start considering that's all bad, then, you know, it's, it feels a little unrealistic. And, and I don't <laughs> disagree with what you're saying. Like I said at the beginning, the point of being a com becoming aware of your bias is so that you individually take responsibility mm -hmm. and when you're interacting with the rest of the community, understand that your actions and your biases are impacting your community. And is that really how you want to impact your yeah, community? Yeah, it's conscious decision. That Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you, I don't, I, you know, I told tell people all the time, I think to get rid of biases, we'd all have to like be on the twilight zone where they zap you with that thing and you, know, you become in another universe, your whole brain changes and then we become, because we, we hear it from, you know, the time you're like two. And I have another short piece about kids and, and biases and how quickly, you know, that becomes a thing. So as part of um, my training with the public defender's office, when they, we, and I, like I said, I've been working with them since 1999. And, and just by saying public defender, I know there's stuff going through your head, like, oh, you know, the worst of the worst, and oh my God. But they're probably your brothers, your sisters, your neighbors, you know, I've had family that's been in and out of the system. And when they call me, I'm just like, look, you can't afford me, call the public defender down there and do whatever you gotta do. But they're my family, and I love them, and I want to see the best for them, regardless of the bad choices that they're making. So as part of my training, before I went into the, um, the um, felony division, because that's really where the most impact is, is seen because people are going to prison and you know we're doing life changing stuff up there and it is scary. But anyway, I had to, um, and I'm also a licensed social worker, but I had to have this whole conversation with Mr. Powell. Many of you may not miss, might remember Mr. Powell, but he was the public defender for over 30 some years, 34, 35 years. And if you know Mr. Powell, and, and if you saw his pictures from back in the day, he went into the military when he was 17. He lied about his age. But the other thing that I said to Mr. Powell was, well, Mr. Powell, it also looked like you could have passed. Do people know what that is? Some are saying yes, some are saying yeah. Back in the day, <laughs> if you were bright enough, like way brighter than Belinda, almost white, <laughs> almost white, you could pass for white. And, and you know, he came up in that age when he could have passed. And he said, I would never do that, Robin. But we had this whole conversation about how important it was for me to be aware of my biases if I were going to do this job and help these people. Because those are those people. The worst of the worst. But any one of us sitting here, I had a lady the other day who, made a bad choice, drove a car uh, without insurance, and killed someone. Nice lady, you see her, you think she's somebody's soccer mom, but she made a mistake, so now she's a criminal because she drove her car, had an accident, and someone died. So, you know, how is that? The conversation that I had was, with her was, as she's making decisions about how we proceed with her case, she also has to think about how this is going to impact her life going forward. She will have this felony conviction on her record. Prior to that, she has no misdemeanors, not even traffic tickets that we could find. But she made one bad decision, and now she's a criminal. And all of you went, oh, she killed somebody. Well, it wasn't like she went out with a gun and shot him. <laughs> you know, yes, she killed someone. 
That is true. There is a grandfather and a father who is no longer with his family because she made a bad choice. But does that make her a bad person? But the label of a felony conviction, when you say that to people, well, I mean, within yourselves, think about what you think about. I don't even need to tell you what you think about. So anytime I go over to the jail or I'm trying to, you know, meet with people, I have to really check myself at the door. This is no longer about Robin Stevens. This is about, I have a job to do, this is the person I need to represent, and I need to represent their voice to the court because that's what I am paid to do. And that's the system we have, and we want the system to be fair to everybody. And even though she did kill somebody, and it was an accident, and it was awful, she's not the worst person walking in the United States. She's not the worst person walking in Washtenaw County. And how do we accept her back into our community without that label that she now has to check on, you know, when she goes to find a job or, you know, do whatever, apartment or whatever, she's got to check, yes, I have that felony. And how does that impact her life? And other than that, she's a very nice lady who just made a really bad decision. So that's what we deal with on a, on a daily basis. And if you as mediators, you don't know who you're getting in the room. So how do you check your biases at the door before the person comes in? Can I? Yes. Can I have, okay. um, so I, this is something that um, we talk about in the mediator training. I'm looking around. I don't know if anybody here was participating in the training that I, that I started facilitating for the BRC four or five years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> More than you want to know. <laughs> I think you. I think you just think of all these people who are so experienced. They've been meeting for a long time. Um, but we talk about that a little bit. Uh, who's at the table with us, and how do we? I mean, of course, in the training material that. Uh, the way it's outlined of the state, they want us to be impartial, neutral, that kind of thing. But I really believe it goes deeper than that. And as the cases have become more complex for the DRC, as society has become more complex, Absolutely. generally, then we get these cases, even in small claims, people have these very unique stories and unique circumstances. And we hear them, and it's so layered, and it's so mired, and like, wow, what have They've been doing all that. <laughs> and, and, and it's quick to have that judgment and to <clears throat> fall into that rabbit hole of bias. And I remember when we started thinking about working in child protection. Ooh. When I started, I met Robin through the child as a child protection mediator. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you remember that. Yep. You were mediating those cases. Yep. And I thought, oh my God, <laughs> they're mediating child protection cases, number one, only, only in Washington County would they do that. The other centers of the state would not do that. Um, it was one thought I had. Um, well, what, but was that started by one of the judges? I think you and Susan were piloting that on behalf of the CEO. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I, I sort of started working here on the tail end of the yeah. pilot. And, um, and I remember just all the thoughts that I had. Um, about Department of Health and Human Services. I have some strong feelings about that state department. Thoughts that I had about, particularly for some reason, moms who lose their kids to the mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. And I struggled with that, so I didn't bother those cases. Like it was a part of a case count, I had to do that kind of stuff, but I did not insert myself in those cases. I mean, Susan was taking care of it at the time. Then years passed and we found ourselves faced with that kind of docket again mm -hmm. um, as a service to uh, the community and particularly to the court. And I had to really work on myself mm -hmm. with that. Um, it's real. So I just wanted to share that, that as you said, that this conversation is not just about blacks and whites. It cuts across everything that we do. And one of the things that I think is true as I navigate this landscape, we think about it in social economics mm -hmm. and education and all of that too. I mm -hmm. mean, some of our families, particularly through that particular, that docket, they may not even have a high school diploma. Right. Um, and it just comes, it's just a, a very heavily packed kind of case. And it we is. have to think about 
those biases and how do we check that in in really and I was at a meeting at one of our schools I won't name it right now uh, this morning and some of the conversations that I heard it was it's, it's a real thing it is. it is and it may be unconscious but it's so real as an outsider sitting in a meeting with high level people in a school building as we talk about the families and kids mm -hmm. that come to that school. Mm -hmm. And we think and, and, and I as a taxpayer I'm thinking this is what this is why we have an achievement gap. All of this <laughs> <laughs> is a part of the bigger problem it is. that we have. But right. how do you talk to me in such a disparaging and using this kind of language? These are your children in your school. Right. I'm paying taxes for you to be here to, you know, to it's really, really a heavy thing, I feel, right, right now, as right. we are trying to grapple with this. <clears throat> and I think some people are really trying to deal with it uh, effectively. And where do we start? You where know, do I we don't start? know. Where right. do we start? But uh, it's such a real thing, and it's a heavy yes. thing. And, and so, as a heads up, these labels, <coughs> and this is the package that they're presenting to the DRC, come help us with restorative justice. And I'm like, <laughs> You're not ready. You can't problem solve with people you don't even respect. Right. You know, so right. it's really, really a heavy thing. It is. It really um, is. Especially in the transformative, restorative justice world, where we think about inclusion, <coughs> equity, mm -hmm. um, balance of power, exactly. and all of that. All of those guiding principles are not even, it's not even there for us to build upon. Right. <laughs> so right. It's, it's really, it's really a, a heavy thing right now. So right. So if, if I, talk, I much less walk the walk. Exactly. I, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know. I, I, no, that's a problem I'll grapple with in terms of programmatically, how do we help, but that's where we're starting. Right. Absolutely. That's where the conversation is starting. And they, they didn't even dress it up to be polite to me, you know what no. I mean? As no. an outsider. Right. It's just really that late. But if you're a um, you know a single mom, six seven kids, and you're there on a truancy mediation because your kids not making it to school every day, you live way out you know past Sycamore Meadows. Bus only runs once every couple hours, and you don't have transportation. And you show up to the mediation, and Sally, who I love more than life itself, and I know is very open, but I walk in and I see. Oh shit, <laughs> she's not going to understand my situation. She's had a life experience. She looks like, you know, she has never had to not have a car. Or she's never not had, you know, more than a kid or two that she could afford. I've got all these kids I can't afford. Yes, I made that choice. I get that. That people have to be responsible for what they do to themselves. But once they've done that, how do we as the community do our best to still make them feel included as opposed to excluded. I hate it when I hear people say, oh, she's a single mom. Like, that's mm -hmm. all she is. Yeah, it's like, okay. <laughs> I think she's got a little more going on than just being a single mom. Maybe she, you know, she's in school. She's trying to make something better of herself. Yes, that's the situation she found herself in. But, you know, we find ourselves in a situation with the president who we all are kind of going, is he or isn't he? Mm. Cray cray. <laughs> <You know? laughs> is he or isn't he? <laughs> you know? So, you know, we, we all have made those kind of judgments about things. And as mediators, again, you can't help it who you are and how you were born and, you know, your, your place in society and your experience, but trying to understand how your life experiences impacts your doing with someone else and how they may perceive you, not how you think you're coming across. Because my kids always tell me all the time, why are you yelling? I'm not. <laughs> why are you asking me, am I yelling? I'm not yelling, I'm explaining. <laughs> and, but they see it as yelling. And so who's wrong? Right, if that's the way they perceive it, I, okay, let me, let me just, let me bring it down then a few, because I need for you to hear me. And so again, being so aware within yourselves of what your biases is, is I hate white women drivers, I'm sorry y'all, but I do, it's like move already, God, what is wrong with you? But that's my bias, I accept it, I embrace it, I know it, so when I get behind a white woman, I'm like holding the wheel, like 
Come on, lady, just go so I can get out with my day. So there are things that we all have. And the, it, it, it's not just about your community, but also yourself and how you are passing on whatever biases you have to other people in your family. I had um, one of my friends who's been coming to our community conversations, and I didn't tell them to do this, but they did it. Um, they had dinner with, let me get this straight, she said her mother-in-law in, -law in um, Milan, who is, she said racist, I, I didn't give her that label, my friend did, and she said some disparaging things, and her son, who is, you know, her son, and my friend's husband, and, and they're white, by the way, um, said, you know what, Mom, I, I, I just can't. I can't sit here and, and listen to this again. Do you understand how that sounds? And their biggest issue was they didn't want their daughter, who's only six, hearing this kind of, you know, crap. She said everything exploded, <laughs> like they couldn't have dinner because this mom was just totally insulted that they would say to her that what she was saying was racist when she was using very derogatory terms about people of color. Mm. And my friend was like, you know, one of my best friends is, you know, and I said, girl, you know that that right there was racist, right? <laughs> my best friends is black, talking about me, you know. But she said that it, it, it was scary because they don't know how to proceed with her mother-in-law now. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to navigate the waters and figure it out, which is why she was, like, trying to talk to me about it. And I'm like, girl, I can't tell you how to talk to a white person. I'm gay. Hey. <laughs> I don't have these problems with my peeps. I tell them what I think and they either take it or they don't. So, you know, I can understand how it can be a very scary process. Even like I keep saying, going within yourself to try to figure out where you are and how you're impacting society, particularly our community, um, as you go through your day. How many people have been to Ipsy this week? Anybody? Awesome. Shopping or just hanging out or you live there? Okay, you live there. I volunteer. Okay, do you live on the south side? Where you live? Uh, northeast. Okay. Anybody live on the south side in here? I live in the township. I mean, yeah. You said it's just <laughs> <laughs> see that right there. <laughs> Coming from a person of color, saying, "Oh, I live in the township. It's just as bad," kind of thing, but without <laughs> saying it. And if you read anything in M Live. That's exactly how they paint it. Like, you know, the township is just like this crazy Wild West kind of place where all kind of stuff happens and dead bodies are found every other day. But that's how the paper, and um, if you ever read, and I just read the comments just because I think they're freaking hilarious. It's like, who are these people that don't have a life um, that respond to this <laughs> stuff? I can't go on M Live every day responding to that craziness. But they'll say things, you know, like, oh yeah, and that was over by Ann Arbor when it was actually in Ann Arbor. <laughs> but, you know, we're not going to let people know that Ann Arbor is this, like, crazy, don't walk down the alleys at night. I read the police reports. Do not walk down the alleys at night, people. Please, even with somebody, don't do it. It is just not safe. Because we get the reports. We know what happens in Ann Arbor. But you don't see that in M Live like you do every time somebody breaks a window in Ipsy. It's like front page. Yep. Yeah, so that for our community to be so small and so compact is very disturbing that we have now kind of shifted every, all the bad things in Washtenaw County are on the east side of the county. And all the good and beautiful and wonderful things are on the west side. And that includes like Chelsea and, you know, Dexter, all that stuff out there. But do those people ever come to Ipsy to shop downtown? And downtown Ipsy has the cutest little shops. I love that Rocket Place. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> that place is cool. <laughs> Took my granddaughter in there. She hit me up. <laughs> I was like, never again. But um, you know, but people don't know that they've got great restaurants. You know, and you can park and walk, and nothing's gonna happen to you. But if you ask somebody from over there, like. Hey, meet me in Ipsy for lunch. Uh, on Carpenter, you mean? No. <laughs> Downtown Ipsy, we're going to... Okay. <laughs> it's like, so just, just knowing that we have that unconscious thought 
within our county is very disturbing in and of itself. And how do we deal with it? How do you deal with it as mediators when you have people sitting across from you who you know have already made, like I said, I'm sitting down going, oh, I got this white woman, she ain't gonna understand nothing. Why am I here? Why am I talking to her? Why am I bothering? You know, she's gonna tell me all about how she thinks I should be living my life. So I adopted a dog from the rescue. And I have a friend that lives in my basement. And she was my campaign manager when I was running for judge. Her father moved, she needs some place to stay. So she's in my basement. So I adopted this dog, his name is Bo. He's a cool dog. But I have a certain way, you know, this is my house. <laughs> my kids knew that, the dog gonna know that. This is my damn house, I pay the bills up in here. So you gonna do what I do. So Bo and I, the first, very first night, we're having this tug of war. You know, he doesn't want to go in the cage. I'm like, you going in that cage? Boy, I don't care what happened. I'm not going to bed till you get in that cage. So it's sounding like World War II in my house. <laughs> and she comes upstairs, what are you doing to the dog? I said, what are you doing up in my house? <laughs> you know, I'm handling my dog the way I think my dog needs to be handled. And if you think it's inappropriate, feel free to call um, the Humane Society or whoever. But get the hell out of my house telling me how to handle my dog, <laughs> you know? But she had an idea of how this needed to go, and she's white, I hate to keep bringing it up, but she is. But she had an idea of how this needed to go, and I had another idea based on, you know, my upbringing. The parent always ruled the dogs, and my dad always ruled our dogs. That was, you establish who's in charge right from the beginning. And so that's how I was dealing with the dog. Now, we, me and Bo cool now, he sleeps with me and we all good and, and we don't have that problem. <laughs> he does, he's a good dog, he's a great dog. Glad I adopted him, glad he found me and saved me. I tell him all the time, I said, boy, you saved me. Um, he did, he's a great dog. But her perception of how this needed to be handled was totally different than mine. And she had no problem coming in my house telling me how I'm going to handle my dog. Okay, what works for you is great and groovy, but what works for me may be different. And who are you to judge one way or the other? Who are you? And that's what I said to her, did God come down and tell you to come talk to me? Because you done messed up. <laughs> you need to go back downstairs and leave us alone while I get this dog in this cage so I can go to bed. But in her reality, that was perfectly okay. We had a conversation about it the next day. She understood my point. She's never been back upstairs to tell me how to handle my dog. So it's all good. But again, as mediators, as people, as community members, as neighbors, we have to be aware of our own biases so that we are not putting on other people what our expectations are of what they should do or how they should be living because they may not have the same resources you have to get somebody to come and cut their lawn, and so therefore their, their yard doesn't get cut as much. Back in the day, somebody would have went over there and said, are you okay, you want me to cut your, your yard? But we don't do that anymore either. We just set the standard of what should happen, and when you don't reach it, then we call in you know, community outreach saying, they haven't cut their grass in six months, and it's making my house value come down. Because it's all about you and your house value, right? It's not about them and what they may be going through. But as a good neighbor, wouldn't the thing be to go over and say, hey, everything okay? See, you haven't cut your grass in a while. Can I help you with that? <laughs> you know? But we don't do that anymore. No, nope. we would rather put our expectations on everybody else. And how does that work for them? Do you like it when it happens to you? No. <laughs> I don't. I don't. It drives me insane. Yes? So I'm wondering, this is kind of jumping ahead, but I hear what you're saying about we really, these biases are, are everywhere. We all have them. All of us. And we most of the time aren't even aware that we have them. So we, okay, so if we grab, somehow rather, take charge mm -hmm. of where we're coming from. And a, uh, one of the parties comes in and sees me and puts all kinds of uh, You're a rich woman who lives in Ann Arbor. Me. Your How? husband's probably a professor at U of M. Y'all probably make two or three hundred thousand dollars a year. You have no idea about my life. How do I transmit 
that we're going to work this process. This is called mediation. This is how it works. I'm not going to tell you what to do. How do I get that across so that that person is going to trust? And, and, and that's a good question. I don't know if Belinda or Sally want to answer it because that's a direct question. I always come from the perception of you've got to listen inside yourself. We know what we're doing wrong. My mom used to tell me, I know somebody told you you shouldn't have did that. Something in your mind told you you shouldn't do that and you did it anyway, right? And 99% of the time she was absolutely right. I thought the woman was psychic instead of psychotic. <laughs> because she, all, I mean, that's, that was her go back to point was, what were you thinking? I hate when they ask you that question. Because so, clearly I wasn't. <laughs> so I, I this, this interview asked that question yesterday. I had probably, so this person is not technically a client of the DRC, so it was a case that was referred to the DRC exactly <coughs> one year ago. The uh, mother did not want to use our services for a number of reasons, but she and I made a strong connection at court. I gave her my card. I invited her to always call and inquire. Uh, it was a child protection case. Um, and she, and we've had some very deep conversations, although she will never say, yes, I want to be at the table. The situation with the child has been resolved, so the baby is fine, she's fine, she's moving forward, she's having some difficulty in moving forward. And she had the same concerns that you're, have, that you're suggesting about yourself. She had that with me. Now, this is an African-American woman. She's probably, technically, I think we only have a couple of years age difference. She's from Detroit. She didn't know I was from Detroit, but she's from Detroit. So she brought a lot of stuff with her, like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm from Detroit, what people think of me, right. this kind of thing that I ran into some trouble, my child was removed, and blah, blah, blah. I have been in touch with her over now 12 months, periodically, I'm thinking maybe five or six conversations, uh, five, fifth or sixth conversation occurred yesterday, and she finally opened up in a way that um, we can do, I, I don't think she's going to come to the table, but she seems to be more amenable to some conflict resolution strategies about some things. And when she was very defensive about what she thought, I thought about her, very defensive, extreme, like she would really dress me, I'm like, you're not even a case, why am I doing, <laughs> I would be like, you know, you're not even a case, why am I doing wow. But I, for some strange reason, really, it was some strange reason, I felt the need to just listen to her, even in the venting, the ranting, the defensiveness, and I made sure at the end of, if, well, maybe the second or third conversation, that we ended the conversation from a place of her strength. Mm -hmm. Smart. And it was just, mm -hmm. it was just really, if, if I have any wisdom, maybe it's developing right now, because that's all I knew to do. I didn't know what else to do. Mm -hmm. And I didn't take it personal. And she, and she really, she has so many assumptions about me because she doesn't know me. Right. Um, and so yesterday in our conversation, I was finally able, in a very gentle and subtle way, to dispel some of her assumptions. I said, oh, you didn't know I'm from Detroit, too. I'm a, I'm a product of Detroit Public School. And so that started building a little bit of trust there, too. Mm -hmm. She calls me because she is terrified and hates everybody at the court downtown. They destroyed her life. They removed her. I mean, uh -huh. she absolutely hates it. She first thought I may be an attorney. Then she realized I wasn't. I'm sure she looked me up. You look I'm like not, an so attorney. I'm kind of a, a safer person than mm -hmm. an attorney might be. Um, but it was a lot of that. And I think the only, and I don't know if this is the answer for every situation, but even in that, when you have one in front of your face mm -hmm. on the table, that's different for those who are mediating. Um, I think we just have to hear it out. Right. Try not to take it personal, and if you absolutely are not able to move forward with the case, you have to re just say maybe someone else can help you better, and I'll, I'll talk to that lead staff or whomever, and we can re reconstruct things. But I, I, one of the things I would say is just don't, please don't take it personal, because right. people are coming in loaded for a number of reasons. Right. Mm -hmm. They got a crisis in life. It's a court case maybe right. for us. Most of our cases are court connected. Uh, and then all of the other stuff that they bring with them, and they just met you 30 seconds ago. Exactly. You know? and, and that's part of, unfortunately, right. maybe, 
that is becoming more and more a part of the deal in the world of mediation as things have become much more, in the last 10 years, I think the cases have become much more complex. Oh yes, absolutely. Than they were when this whole program was started mm -hmm. 30 years ago. Absolutely. It I just has. So. And that's across so. the state. Right. What's in a place of her strength? So yesterday, for example, the conversation she had about uh, yesterday, so she has asked, she didn't, her rights were not terminated, but the child was with the Foster. Uh, no, she, the child went to live with the dad. So oh, okay. It became a custody arrangement. Wow. So, so the place of strength yesterday was about, uh, so she went through, let me back up, so she went through the first holiday season without this child. So I think she's just feeling extremely low. So her, the, a lot of her conversation was about what she can't do as a mom. Mm -hmm. And so the, how we ended it is, let's think about some things that you can do as a mom that's still, so that she can carry that label right. of the mother. So right. doing her hair, to going out shopping for the first intimate female underwear, I'm trying to be politically correct. <laughs> 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 of those little things, <laughs> she's at that age, right. um, became a place of strength, because she hadn't thought about it. Mm -hmm. Right. She, and, and, but she, so that's how, we, that's how we were able to end it yesterday. But what kind of mother gets her kid removed? I tried to get them to take mine, they wouldn't. <laughs> it's such a convoluted, it's what such kind a of mother sad, gets her kids removed? Yeah, you must be the worst story, mother ever. And, and she, and I think, and that's that was the tenor of the conversation. Exactly. What kind of woman am I? Right. Everybody here thinks I go to the agencies, and they all think this, they all think that. And I think it was the only reason why she continues to call and I actually recognize her phone number on the caller ID, is because I just listen, I, because I'm not, yeah, you're a bad, I, I don't, we don't evaluate cases. I don't right. know all of the intimate details of the case and that kind of thing. Right. And I really, honestly, today, now 15 years ago when I started here, I would have been like, what kind of woman gets her daughter? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of woman gets her but child But today, taken? it's like, a thing, a, a bad thing happened, but you're not a bad person. Exactly. And you're still her mom. So right. Something went well because they did not terminate her rights. Yeah. And the court had the absolute you know, responsibility mm -hmm. to make that determination. Yeah. And they didn't feel the need to do that. You're still her mom. You're still her mom. Mm -hmm. And you're still and a human. And you're still worthwhile to our community. Exactly. And we want yeah. you to get your kids back because I don't want to pay for your kids to stay it. somewhere right. else. But, but that's how get your shit together, get your kids. Well, in some past conversations, that's, that was the place of strength. Like, yes. What are you going to, you know, you have these job you know, searches or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, you know, oh, that's a good one. Put that on your resume. Those yeah. kinds of things. Mm -hmm. so, Great. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I haven't been a media for very long. <laughs> Are we scaring you yet? <laughs> <laughs> um, but and I'm a transplant from Pennsylvania, and I guess just before I started doing what I'm doing now, I was a caseworker at a welfare office. Oh Lord Jesus! So um, I had to interview people first for like food stamps, that kind of thing, and then later uh, long-term care Medicaid, and I. Where, you know, yes, uh, listen, listening to the person as if they are another human being sitting across from you is key. Um, a lot of people came to the table with uh, biases towards me because it's like, what are you, 12? Like, no, I'm actually, um, I am the caseworker working on your case, and no, I'm not actually 12. Um, but uh, listening to the other person um, as another human being, and then in the context of what we've been doing as mediation, the, the reframing. I think is huge. It's like showing that you are actually listening and yep. that's how you like demonstrate that you're listening and able to get back to them, okay, so what I'm hearing you say is this and it sounds like maybe you're feeling this way and that seems to, it's been working for me so far. <laughs> so. That's good. But I think I wanted to respond. Um, what I don't want you to walk away with is that you somehow have to be something other than who you are. Because you are who you are. You've got whatever 
you know, experiences you have. My experiences are um, shaped by a man who had to leave his house in the middle of the night because the KKK was coming through the front door and his mother's telling him to run out at nine in the middle of the night and they ended up in Tennessee. That's my dad. And my mother, who had a different experience, came from Missouri and, you know, was able to transition all the way through high school and get a high school diploma. So those, that's what my experiences are shaped by. You know, my father's experience experience with America when he take us down to Mississippi, don't look him in the what? Don't look those people in the face. Fuck them. This is what my brother and sister I mean, like, you know, because we're born in the north. We didn't know. But for him, that was a very scary experience and it happened when he was nine and he carried that for a long, long time. And so for him to be able to raise children and not have that bias, impossible. Impossible. So we had to do our own kind of, you know, and my brother's still mad about it, but, you know, we had to do our own kind of internal to figure out how we navigate this world that we live in to be, get to the places that we are now. Of course, I'm the only one in the family of my six siblings that has been to college and then went on to law school, so they think I'm all some kind of, you know, magical genius, which is BS on top of BS, but whatever. <laughs> But that's because their experience has been different than mine. And my drive to do something was different than theirs. It wasn't that, you know, some magical doors opened for me. I was still a single mom on welfare when I went back to, to college and what have you. And carrying that whole bias, because I went to Washington off for two years and then, again, didn't even take my first college course until my daughter started kindergarten. So I was in my 30s. And then transferred to U of M. Anybody go to U of M as a non-traditional student? That is torture. Torture. You're listening to these children talk about, oh, I was partying last night, I didn't get my homework done. I got laundry done on my floor. <laughs> I put kids to bed. Are you serious right now? You know, and then they're telling me all about what I need to be aspiring to. And they could be my children. So that is an experience in and of itself that shaped me also to where I am today. And then I ended up being a counselor at U of M, got them back. That was good. <laughs> had an opportunity to tell them, look, what you think this is, is not, you're not walking out of here making $180,000 a year. That's not happening. That's the reality. But that's what they expected because that was their background. And if you get into a good school like U of M, then of course you're going to make big money. And when they got out, they owe all this money and they only make $30,000. They just <laughs> totally blown away and confused and can't believe it because that's never been their reality. Going to college equates to money for some people. And that's what they expected. And when they didn't get what they expected, then it was very, very different. So I just want to play this last clip because, again, back to your point, this stuff starts when you're very, very young. From the time you could navigate the world and think, things have been coming at you and coming into your mind and making you who you are. No one is asking you to put that aside because that's what makes you the person that you are and probably a really, really good mediator. But what we are trying to do is to make you more aware of the fact that you have stuff that started long before you had an opportunity to even know it. You have no control over what goes on in the back of your mind, but you do have control over how you respond to it. And that's the most important piece race in the hidden picture. It's a project over a year in the making. Now, race relations is one of the most explosive issues in this country, and for many adults, the most taboo to talk about with kids. But what a lot of adults don't realize is that kids, even as young as six years old, are already talking about or thinking about race. And what they say is making friends with kids of other races is hard and only gets harder as they grow up. We teamed up with renowned child psychologist, Dr. Melanie Killen, to scientifically measure children's attitudes on race. Take a look at this. Dr. Killen and her team showed six-year-old children this picture and asked them questions like, what's happening here? Are these children friends? And would their parents want them to be friends? The picture is designed to be ambiguous. What's happening is in the eye of the beholder. Then they showed them this picture and asked the same question. Now the only difference in the pictures, the race of the children was flipped. Both white and African American children were tested and in addition to the six-year-olds, the psychologists showed a similar set of pictures to 13-year-olds. At our request, they also asked kids open-ended questions about race to try to understand how it plays into their own lives. 
The responses were raw. Some of the experiences they described were frankly shocking. This is the reality of what kids see, hear, and think about race. Listen. If you have the same skin, you can play together. But if you don't have the same skin, you can't play together. So why can't you play together if you have different color skin? Because your mom might not want you to play with that friend. It's okay to tell people that they can't be your friend because of the color of their skin? Mm-hmm. Why is that okay? Because your mom will not want them to be the same, be, be a different color um, friends. Do you think it'd be easy for a kid to convince his parents that it would be okay to have other types of people mm -hmm. over? Why not? Mm -hmm. Probably because you might get in trouble. Mm. Why would a parent want to put want you to get in trouble if you wanted someone to come over to your house who is a different skin color? Probably because um, they don't allow. Why not? Why would parents, some parents not allow other skin color kids to come over? Probably because they might not like that skin color. I've been really different, like the way I look and the way my skin at my previous school that I went to. And they just kept on bullying me and I didn't like it. I just asked them to stop like over and over again. And then I tried to like, I tried not to play, mm -hmm. but I couldn't like hold on anymore. So I asked my mom, can I leave? My grandparents have a lot of um, like they're very racist mm -hmm. against African Americans and like other races, but it's 2012, so they have to like push that aside, and they'll be like, "No, that that's wrong to me. You have, you want to stick with your own race?" And I'm like, "No, I'm friends with everyone." Well, there was more. Our scene and study found signs of hope and progress as well. Why? If somebody has like a different kind of skin color, they should. They all, if they're their friend, you always should be friends. So like, I have tons of friends that are black and I'm white. It doesn't matter what skin color you are. Um, it just, it's just inside here, like in your heart. This is the second time that 360 has scientifically studied children and race. Back in 2010, we discovered that kids as young as five picked up on racial attitudes in the world around them and all of the ugliness that can sometimes come with that. Now this time around, we wanted to understand why children have these attitudes on race, how those attitudes change as kids get older, and how the race of their classmates may shape the adults that are going to become. We begin tonight with the results of the younger children in our study. Oh, you don't have the right color skin. We tested 145 kids at six schools spread across three states. The schools had three different racial makeups, majority white, majority African American, and racially diverse. Why do you think that Brenda pushed Sarah? Because she wanted to get on the swing. What the research found might surprise you. The first headline, overall, young white children are far more negative about interactions between the races than young black children. When white children were shown with these pictures, they had a negative interpretation 70% of the time, meaning they were much more likely to say this. How did he fall off? Bobby pushed them. I think Brenda pushed Sarah off the swing. Do you think that he did something that was good or bad? Bad. Then they were to say this. And how good would you say what Bobby is doing is? Super good. Super good? <laughs> white kids are also far more likely to think the white child and black child in the picture are not friends. They think their parents wouldn't approve of them being friends. But why? Responses like this might begin to explain. Do you think it would be as easy to ask your mom to have someone over who's the same skin color and someone over who's a different skin color? Uh, yeah, that might be hard. What, what about it might be hard? Because all of my people in my family are white and not much like people that my mom knows and dad knows mm -hmm. are black or brown yeah. or anything. So it might be kind of hard to ask your mom mm -hmm. to have a friend over who's yeah. black or brown? Mm -hmm. What do you do? Oh, I don't want to be your friend because I like being in the black skin. Okay. What is it about skin color that sometimes kids think they might not want to be friends? Because they don't, they, like their color, 
if they don't like brown, so they want a white color skin. Let's say this is an ambiguous situation. Our expert, Dr. Melanie Killen, says children's own experiences with race, along with the messages they hear at school and at home, the characters in the TV shows they watch, what they see online, all of those have an effect. But the subtle messages adults might not even realize they're sending also have a huge effect on children. Dr. Killen calls it implicit bias. When we're in a situation in public, we're in a room, and we have an opportunity to ask two different people for help for something, um, and we might just, you know, be more likely to ask the person of the same race and somebody of an opposite race for help. All of that really has a very powerful influence very early in children's lives, much earlier than we think. But if all kids internalize what they see and hear about race, why are young black children more positive about race than young whites? Remember, 70% of young white kids saw these and thought something negative happened. When black children looked at the same pictures, only 38% saw something negative, meaning they were much more likely to see this. What's going on with Carrie? Um, she's upset that her What's going on with Chris? He, he was waiting for his turn. Positive attitudes, despite experiences like this. My grandma wanted to be only her daughter friend because he's only white and I'm black. Okay, so it happened with your friend's mom mm -hmm. that only wanted him to be friends with people who were the same color? Mm -hmm. And so he didn't want you to be friends? Yes. Oh, how does that make you feel? Sad. And was it something that they said? Mm -hmm. How did they say it? It's a big marker for because they're not the same color. They said that you can't be friends because you're not the same color? Mm -hmm. She dropped her mom. Six-year-old Ciara was so vocal about race, I asked her more questions afterwards. You've heard people talk about other people's skin color. And what kind of stuff do they say? They say... Um, they say to the teacher, I don't like their black skin. Can, can they go to another school? You've heard people say that? So why are young black children more positive about race than young whites? Dr. Killen says the misperception from some parents that kids are colorblind has a lot to do with it. African American parents are very early on preparing their children for the world of um, diversity and also for the world of potential discrimination. In contrast, what we find is that a lot of white parents, they sort of have this view that if you talk about race, you are creating the problem. And what we're finding is that children are aware of race very early. Anderson Cooper, CNN. <coughs> Hail out. Trump! Hail our people! Hail oh, victory! Sorry. <laughs> you, you done? Our living experience. Hail, yeah. <laughs> we did a whole uh, thing on Richard Spencer. Oh, oh. Yeah. It was actually very um, interesting. I was interested to realize the number of uh, Caucasian people who were not aware of his alt-right groups and what they were up to. It was really kind of eye-opening for me. Did you, have, did you want to say something or just? Oh, no, sorry, I'm just thinking, <laughs> <I'm> thinking. <coughs> Anybody have comments as to your reaction? Yes. I'll just share with you a, a, a historic perspective on Ann Arbor. Uh-huh. If you live in the Detroit. Uh, back in the early 70s, uh, as a, active in school board politics, we were confronted with a challenge from uh, what we call the Green Mold Mamas who wanted to protect and perpetuate what was called Black English as the language in the classroom and the challenge to the school board to try to accommodate this, this, this request. Mm -hmm. Naively, we concluded that would be a mistake because it would perpetuate the ghettoization of the public, public housing complexes. And I don't know today whether there are any issues uh, surrounding trying to protect the cultural significance of black English. Hmm. I don't, I haven't heard any, I mean, you know, there, I, and, and I'm the first to tell people, I, you know, I call my, I, I can go either way. I can dress it up and talk like the five degrees I have, 
or I can get in the street and, and roll with the punches and roll with the boys and be all down with everybody. <laughs> I can do it either way. It works for me. So I think um, as a society that my experience, and I always want to, want yeah, I can't speak for all black people, particularly in, in this county because it is such a diverse county. And I live in probably one of the most diverse neighborhoods in uh, Washington County. I live over behind uh, Myers on Carpenter Road. And um, one of my neighbors is from Brazil and somebody else is from Japan. The neighbor's right next to me. I can talk to the son and the daughter, but I can't talk to the parents because they don't speak English. Um, so our community is very disconnected. I think there's, there's uh, one white male who he and I joke we're the only Americans on, in the whole <laughs> complex, but that's not true. But that's what we joke about because everybody else, you know, is different from us. So even with him and I having that connection, we still have that disconnect. And like I say to him, they don't bother you about stuff. I have one of my neighbors say, are you going to clean up your backyard? And of course, I'm like, <laughs> but I didn't say that. I would, you know, yes, I'm going to get to it. Thank you very much for reminding me that it needed to be done. Um, but they didn't do the same thing to him when he was building his deck, and he had a bunch of crap back there. There was nothing said to him whatsoever. But after my deck was done and the wood hadn't been moved quick enough, I had to be asked if I was going to get that up or just leave it there. <laughs> it's like, okay, whatever. So, you know, it's just that whole, um, it, it, it just is part of who we are. Just, we can't help it. We're inundated <coughs> with it. Even if you look at, um, you know, any TV, how often do you see, doctors of color, not just black, but Asian or, you know, Japanese or whatever. You just see, you know, the white males or the white females who are always in charge of everything, and then they're saving all the minority people because they can't figure it out on their own. So, yes, ma'am. Um, on that clip, I, I was just struck particularly by the end finding of the researcher, the least that she shared, um, was that the difference in children's reactions in terms of um, seeing a more negative mm -hmm. uh, situation in those um, cartoons had a lot to do with parents of colored children um, preparing their children for the world. Absolutely. And white parents not wanting to talk about race. <laughs> not not so much putting negative ideas directly in mm -hmm. their but more uh, unconsciously by avoiding the subject, that that resulting in them, I guess, absorbing everything else. Everything else. Right. That really struck me. That is, and that's a good point. Thank you for bringing that out. And my friend who had the conversation with her, her grandmother, or her husband's mother, uh, said to me, you know, I think I'm going to buy my daughter some black dolls. I said, really? What are inanimate objects going to do for your daughter? And I said it to her just like that. like. What is buying black dolls going to do? Well, I want her to be exposed. I said, well, she needs to make a friend. She needs a human being <laughs> that she can, you know, see that it's a regular family and they're doing everything. But when we are so segregated in terms of living situations in this community, how do you do that? You don't just walk up to somebody and say, hey, I want you to be my black friend. Yeah, no, it'll cost you. <laughs> um, right, so how do you do that? And how do your kids do that? Go ahead. No, no, you go first. You go well, the first. question that comes to my mind, because that, that was exactly what I was sitting here thinking with my head over here, was because I, well, I grew up in an all-white community in California. There were a lot of, no, wrong, there were a lot of um, Hispanic Hispanics. farm workers, yeah. and there were a lot of them in, middle, in, so in farming, farming communities. In, but not in your community. Where I grew up. Yeah. There was two sides, but there was nobody that was African-American black. There was just the Mexicans and the white. So we didn't talk about black and white at all, ever. And that's why I went to college and I was like, oh, there's this whole other type of person that I didn't know about. And then a bunch of others as well. But the point is, is I didn't learn to talk about it because we didn't, it wasn't part of my life or my world. And <coughs> so I was really naive mm -hmm. for a while. It took me a while. So the question I have and that what comes to my mind is, so if this research is as powerful as it sounds like, just like any other kind of education in uh, in an early childhood or elementary school, are there programs to help children of all types, but white children in particular, talk about race, mm -hmm. or is it all through the family that we're we're that we're having these questions? I, I'm I'm throwing that as a question. So I don't know. I have no clue. 
Do you want to answer that? No, I don't have an answer to that question. My guess is no. <laughs> right, and I, that's what I was going to say. I'm not aware. I'm not even aware of, of places, you know, other than the community conversations that we're giving for grown folk to go and talk yeah. about it. Yeah. So, but I, there, just the answer to that, um, one answer, Southern Poverty Law Center has a program teaching tolerance. They've got really good educational materials for uh, teachers to teach about race and activities. And can I just tell you that the word tolerance gets on my nerve? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. You, you tolerate a toothache because you can't get to the, some medication, but as soon as you can fix that toothache, you fix it. This doesn't need to be fixed. And, I, and, and I'm not attacking you. I know, and don't get defensive. That's the thing. And so just like we're having this conversation and how someone can get, and I'm not picking on you again, but how people can feel like you're attacking them, and you're not. You're just trying to point out that for some people, certain words carry certain things. And being able to accept that as much as possible, that for me, the word tolerance just, it's like, like I said. I don't know why he has changed it. <laughs> or why he ever called it. Yeah. I mean, you're not, you're bad. There's something right. I got to tolerate you. Instead of saying we have this acceptance program where we just accept you the way you are no matter what. Or you know, celebrate. Differences. Celebration. Whatever. <laughs> but not that word tolerance is really, it's old. It's from the 70s and probably when you guys were <laughs> doing your things. I think I wanted to respond to comment about raising children. I, I'm looking around, I'm not sure who might have a child younger than mine. Well, you do. You have a baby. Um, <laughs> Congratulations. Very young baby. He was in law school. Wow. Was so. <laughs> God bless you. Um, so I have a 17-year-old now, and I started working here. He was two. So <clears> he's grown up in this world of DRC, Mediation Conflict Resolution. This is still part of the discussions around my house. Uh, as we talk about the work day, my husband works for a nonprofit organization in Detroit that does human service work. So we talk about the ills, the conditions, and how we overcome it, problem solving, decision making, all that kind of stuff. Um, so you, you said that part of what struck you is that we talk about our race with our kids very young and help to prepare. As an African American parent of an African American child, if I didn't do that, I would not have served him well. Uh, at 17, getting ready to graduate from high school, he had to be prepared to step outside my house. It makes me upset when I talk about it. So, mm -hmm. so how would the conversation be different then if you flip it to whatever? If you're well, talking to a white child about that, I don't know what happens to my family. No, no, I wish you guys no, did. No, no. I, I talk mean, about I'm it. Asking, honestly. What would you imagine since assume, assuming that white boys don't have the same risk, life risk. That the I, you know, I don't know what the conversation should be or how it should be, but I know in my house, with my boy, it had to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do, but do, do white I, mothers have to tell their sons? Well, then, like, no, how, what kind of different conversation could we have? To do well, let me share, let me share just this encounter I had when my son was about 10 months old, um, his first year almost two years of life, I was a stay-at-home mom. And, and I live in a small town. I really didn't have any friends. So me and Chuck, and we often would go to Detroit and visit with family. But if, when I didn't go to Detroit, I was in Canton, and I took him to McDonald's. Um, he was beginning to feed himself, so he was eating french fries, and we sat in a playscape so that he could look at the other kids play. He wasn't walking, so I didn't let him climb and play. And he is not even a year old. Keep that in mind. He's a baby. He can't really talk. He's doing just what babies do. And there was a little boy, maybe four, three or four. He was someone who was about three or four. And he had a little sister who may have been two. She was in a high chair. My son was in a high chair. The two moms were looked like they were getting together for lunch, and they were letting the little kids play. And, this, and they were white. And this little white boy looked at my son and said, is that a black baby? <laughs> Is that a real black baby? Mama, look, she got a black baby. It's a real black baby. <laughs> and that broke my heart. That was my son's experience. He was just as cute, cuddly, warm. Everything you think a baby is, my child was that for me. Yeah, just a baby. Eating McDonald's.
McDonald's french fries. We thought at that time the best french fries in the world. Eating McDonald's french fries. And it was loud. And it, and it was obnoxious. And it was leave my child alone <laughs> at the moment. But what was most hurtful is that those women never looked at me to acknowledge me, to acknowledge my child, or to educate their own. Mm. Hell yeah, he's a real baby. He's a baby just like this. <laughs> you all are. Mm -hmm. He got on a diaper, he pees and poops, he eat everything. Yep. They didn't say a word to us. They didn't say a you word. Never... To, mm. They didn't give us eye contact. Mm. So I knew at that moment, regardless of everything, I want, you know, the fairy tale life I gave my child. My son thinks he's the first, the real Prince Charles. His name is Charles. <laughs> he's, he's gorgeous. He's all of those things to me. But if I didn't teach him how to live with race in, here in America, he, what will happen to him? Mm -hmm. What will he do? He's just got his license. He's driving, scared to death. Yeah. What do you do when police pull you over? My son went from this cute little boy to a 6'1", 270-pound, 17-year-old oh. defensive tackler. He's scaring people. <laughs> Big black boy. He's scaring people. And he's probably the and sweetest kid. And he wore kid. a high-top haircut. He just got his hair cut a few, two days ago. That added another two and a half, three inches to his height. Mm -hmm. We have to talk about that. It's like you get ready to go to school, you go into the recruitment thing, cut your hair, boy. Right. You gotta cut your hair. You gotta do this. You gotta do. We are constantly, and it feels like paranoia sometimes. Mm -hmm. But if I don't, it's fear. It's my reality. It's I've fear. been I've been pulled over and incarcerated <laughs> in the car on a. I don't even know. Oh, driving with a expired tag. I went to jail for that. Oh my god. In Michigan. I mean, I went to jail. I was about six hours in jail. Book, book shots. This happened, I, I, for 20 years I didn't even talk about it, I was so embarrassed. Like, I'm in, like I got to call my job, to because we didn't have cell phone. I had to call my job to call my husband to come get me out of jail. Wow. I was like, got to get my tags on my car. <laughs> <laughs> I blamed him for it. Right. <laughs> so I had to, you know, we have to talk about it. I don't have a choice. Right. Well, my reaction was, I was admiring the families that were talking about it with their children watching that clip and kind of my judgment was it's really sad that a lot of families don't talk about it and look at the results of that it makes perpetuate it's, it's an interesting thing I've had white children do sleepovers at my house because my son cannot do sleepovers at their house you know like can you guys take the sleepover thing to somebody else's house for a turn <laughs> which you know get up early make the pancakes and all of that yep no mom they have to come over here we I can't go over there. I, those are real, and that's, I mean, my son is 17. These are my life experiences in this decade. He was born in 2000. So it just seems like the next phase, if you want to call it that, is helping the reverse happen. You know, if it needs to be scripted or taught in a different way. If you're in an all-white community, how can you talk? Well, but you have to. That's the whole thing. But, but <laughs> then they'll go, oh, look, there's a black baby. I never saw a black right. baby. <laughs> yeah, that has to be a normal no. thing, a normal conversation, not a I would have been, I think, I think, I think I would have been fine with that experience had those women just acknowledged me that I'm a mother. Or smile here them. with my kids sitting in a crappy <laughs> McDonald's french fry and eating. Yeah, and he's a black you. baby and there's a white baby. Right, yeah, or, yeah, or exactly. educating yeah. the child. And the yeah. coming yeah. all different colors. Yeah, that's a yeah. black baby. But he is. has a black mommy and they're eating just like we are. And how are you? Yeah. And normalizing it. And just normalizing, normalizing the fact it. that I was doing exactly what, what they, they were doing. doing. Absolutely. I think she had a question over here, is that or a statement. Oftentimes he'd be perceived as a potential NFL football player rather than a mid school candidate. I have to call that, I still <laughs> fight that fight. I, yeah, that's a, probably another conversation, but when he was being asked to play football, very nice. They, they do. The kids get the kids ready for sports. I wouldn't let them play football because I was afraid of football more than, than anything else. And he really wanted to play, but the deal was this. 
when you know everything it is to know about the game of football as an industry, you can play. So I thought that would dissuade him. That boy spent two summers reading up and understanding. <laughs> he's really he's good. good he can write plays. <laughs> he wants to, at one time wanted to be coach. Whatever. I mean, but that is, and I have had to tell coaches, he's here for an education. <laughs> He actually could be a doctor if that's what he wants to do. Right. He's not just a kid on a field with a ball. So that's it's it's a lot of that, and it's constant. Mm -hmm. From the moment I put him in school, it's been constant, all ongoing for 12 years of my life. Mm -hmm. That this is the conversation I have with people. And we just happen to live in a predominantly um, white community, Republican Christian community. It's changing now. I'm um, over the last five to seven years, but this has been constant, like there is no break from the concept that we're black people, right. that it's just constant, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, because no. I love who I am, no. and where I'm from, and my heritage, but it's constant yeah. in dealing with all of the labels and stereotypes and assumptions, I'm like, he's tall, and he has big feet, because they grew. It's not because of anything else, and I actually want them to stop growing because the shoes are so expensive. But there's nothing you can do about that. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. He can't do anything about his size. No. Mm -hmm. Or his color. Or his color. Or his race. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, do you want to? Yeah, <laughs> I was just thinking about like, um, when you are not in that situation, I heard the same thing with, which shocked me, because I obviously grew up in a kind of monocolor. Um, culture so I didn't this is something that I was exposed as it about and a friend of mine whose child is the the by uh, mixed race kid and the the son um, has a darker color and she realized that she actually need to tell him how to bring himself and into the world and she's white then it just struck me up uh, if you are not in that position, you don't even think about it mm -hmm. when the other people um, needs to experience, like you say, constant phases. Mm -hmm. And I also thought about that something, I wonder, it's different, maybe different degree, but I wonder if the girl's um, experience, like girl's mom tells, if the mother has the girl, then we would tell her, you know, don't dress like this, don't walk in the alley by yourself. And I, blah 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Don't park the car in between the two cars. These things that boys' mom never thought about. Mm -hmm. Never. True. That right? is very so true. So it's kind of similar thing. It's very similar. Different mm -hmm. intensity. Mm -hmm. um, so if you and I'm not saying this is a, as an excuse, but if you've never experienced that, uh, yeah. then it's even. It's not because that person is inconsiderate. It's just so hard to even imagine how. That it's an issue. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And um, I took a stats class. I hate math, period. I can't even balance my checkbook. But we had one person who was of Asian descent. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting at U of M in front, you know, and, and a couple of white guys said, they're going to um, mess up the curve. Because <laughs> we are good at math. Exactly. Right? And I'm thinking there, I'm like, what does that mean? Like. <laughs> Should we kill them now or what? You know, I didn't. I didn't get it until years later, and it was because the person was Asian, and they just knew that they were going to do better in the stats than anybody else. And I aced the class, so you know, it was like, and I hate math, so. But it was just that perception that they're the best at math, so of course they're going to, you know, just like your son's going to be a football player because he's, you know, big black man. Yeah, well, he can make a lot of money. But you got a question or a statement? Oh, well, I was still responding to what you saw now about you know having the. The conversation with your white children about black children, um, it, it can't be isolated like that. I mean, you have to choose like where you're going to live or what schools they should attend. I think you have to, you know, try to have diversity. It's not just black and white. Uh, travel, you know, join clubs or something. We had foreign exchange students in the, in our house, you know, all different kinds. Just you know, just expose them to all different mm -hmm. kinds of people. Uh, yeah, I didn't see any of you all at the Charles H. Wright um, African American uh, oh, yeah. Kwanzaa celebration. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like, not a single white person was there. Not a single white person. <laughs> that I saw on the day that I went, but they had many days. But on the day that I went, which was the, the start, 
didn't see one single, and I thought, wow, this would be something really cool for a family to bring their kids to, because there was music and dancing, and there was a whole kids section where things, you know, they were making art and doing all this other stuff. It would have been an awesome way to introduce a kid who doesn't have that opportunity all the time to, you know, African American culture or African culture. Open this up. You said one of the things that we have to do. And this is a cross. Guys, I like growing up in Detroit, in a lot of ways, especially at that time, uh, which I was born in '67. Um, it was just as uh, homogeneous when I was a kid. You know, there was um, a couple Native American families still in Detroit. Mm -hmm. Maybe a couple um, uh, Middle Eastern families in Detroit um, before people were slowly migrating throughout the '70s, getting out of the city. Uh, even at that time, um, and I think that part of the openness is just being, you know, in a lot of ways I have been forced to be in spaces that where I'm the only black, I, you know, for work, yep. for <laughs> All college, the time. graduate school, uh, I, went to grad, I went to school in Detroit at Wayne State, but yeah. it was still a very small, uh, part of a very small minority. We have to, you know, so I was forced to, but, but as an adult, I have been comfortable, and I'm comfortable in being in spaces, in going places, in meeting people, and talk. When I came to the DRC, there weren't anybody. I don't know if I met you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if there was anybody who looked like you. But I had to meet the mediators. I had to develop relationships. I had to do those things, and I had to initiate those conversations. Right. And I'm very comfortable doing that. Right. Sometimes, I think, the reverse is not true. Like, do you feel as equally comfortable in going places that you may not, you know, like going to Beezy's mm -hmm. uh, in downtown, it's a great restaurant. Yes, it is. It's one of my favorite spots. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and just being in a different space, and, you know, and again, I come, you know, this generational family, my grandmother would be at the grocery store, she just started chatting with people in line, and it was, and I thought, Stop talking to strangers. <laughs> <laughs> but at some point, but in some ways, it's like that comfort yes. mm -hmm. of talking to people, right? Being kind, mm -hmm. showing that friendliness and warmth. I think that's a draw. It is. That's and and just you know that experience that I share with my son. Had those women done that with me, mm -hmm. McDonald's, I probably would let my son crawl on the playscape with her kids. Because he really, he, he was demonstrating at a very early age he needed to interact and he needed something more than his mom because I was barneyed out and, you know, all the stuff, baby stuff, I was getting over it. But um, and that's part of it, just showing that warmth and kindness and feeling comfortable being in those spaces because it's not as scary. Some, something that's really given us a clear message to be afraid of one another. Right. That's in a lot of places I media. Mm -hmm. and media. And it's just not. Right. It really is not the truth. Mm -hmm. So it's when that girl media. says that those kids, the little black girl says that you can be kind or you can come over and play, that is very true. It is. For us. We encourage our kids to make relationships and play and go have fun and eat that food and learn something new. My son's introduction to spicy food was at an Indian's house. Neat. Nice. Because we don't do spicy at my Either. And she said, "Is it okay?" I said, "Sure, you can feed them if you want to. If you want to feed them, he has food. good luck. Good luck. <laughs> you can feed them." So Sally has pushed her chair Thank back. Thank you. I have. I pushed my chair back <laughs> because we always, we always we always end on time, except this time because Sally. it was really um, such a, a rich conversation. I really appreciate. Um, Everybody's yes. coming. Sure, thank you. Thank you all for opening yourselves up.